Sorry, from Parker Brothers. With all of the hiccups and distractions and cameras going out, you know, uh, all I can say is, I'm sorry. You'd almost think it was part of the theme this morning. It is good to see you. Hello. And it is uh, wonderful to be with you on this second Sunday. Uh-oh, so my internet is coming on. Better watch out. You never know what's going to pop up. Turn that off. All right. Hey, let me start over again. <laughs> Had a virus checker going on there. Uh, it is good to be with you on this second Sunday of 2021. And let me ask you on this second Sunday, how are you doing? You doing well? Well, let, let me share with, with you. All I can say is for me, well, I'm hunky dory, full of glory this morning. So it is so good to be with you. Uh, as always, let me just begin by saying uh, thank you. And, and that's from a sincere heart this morning. Thank you. Uh, to our wonderful team here at Elevating Life Church, trying to stuff the pastor with all the emotions, everything. And so thank you for your worship. It is so meaningful and purposeful here at Elevating Life Church. So thank you for your witness towards praising God and serving people. All right, let's jump right into the message, shall we? Can we do that this morning? Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians this morning, however you're going to get there, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, again on the second Sunday of the new year. Now, as you're turning there, let me give you just a, a little bit of direction here. Uh, today, for the next few moments, I want to ask you this question. Are you with me? Let me ask you this question. What wrong or mistake, or we can say injury in life, that could be real or, or perceived, are you holding on to to take sweet revenge on, let's say, your oppressors, your tormentors, or perhaps your persecutors? You know, those who have done you wrong. I wonder what mistake or sin be it with yourself or otherwise, are you holding on to to take sweet revenge? Now, if you call yourself a Christian, raise your hand if you call yourself a Christian. Call yourself a Christian, then it is your responsibility, your duty, if you will, to be the mature one uh, in, in, in the faith, and to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, and every form of malice. It's your responsibility, no one else. Now, if you do not follow this instruction, this teaching, and, 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 and this command, if you don't, you are out of the will of the Father, out of the presence of the Lord, out of His goodness, if you will, and your reality is hell here on earth. Who's with me? Now, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Come on. Again, what wrong are you holding onto to take sweet revenge? So today I want to help you to cure your anger problem once and for all by preaching a message titled Sweet Revenge. So with that, uh, read with me our core verse and solution to our anger problem in who we are and what we do. We can say individually and collectively, and we'll say in the Christian faith, because that's where our responsibility lies. Now, first, I'll read the verse, what I'm going to do here. Then I'll pray. Then we're going to go back to Ephesians uh, 4, again, to, to resolve any inclination to take sweet revenge out of the picture. So in other words, don't close your Bible because we're going to be in Ephesians 4 the whole time. So again, read with me where we are going to end up at the end of this message. 
Ephesians 4.32 reads this way. I'll be reading from the NIV. And it says this, this is the solution. And we're going to look at some things and get back to this. But Paul says here quickly, Be kind and compassionate to one another. I'd encourage you to look around to one another, not only in here, but your neighbor as well. Talking to two of my neighbors, Pastor. How you doing, neighbor? Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Hear that this morning. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Now I'm gonna, we're going to go back to this. So join me in prayer as we go deep into of the Bible to resolve our anger challenges and revenge issues once and for all in Christ. So let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your compassion towards us. And forgive us for failing to do likewise with one another. We say, uh, collectively we say, sorry for our reckless ways. And we ask for your love because we know love covers a multitude of sins. We now yield to your knowledge and understanding in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Now, at this point in my life, I'm going to have to say something here. I got to say sorry. And I say sorry because. Um, I've never played the game. Sorry, never have. In fact, I didn't even know what it was about until I, 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 I brought the, the thought about this message back in October when I do my off-site. Didn't, didn't even know what it was. I've heard about it, of course, but I didn't know what it was. However, with the little bit of research I did, I found out that the point of naming the game Sorry was indeed meant to be sarcastic. And let me say this, sarcasm is anger's ugly little cousin. And sarcasm is nothing more than hostility designed or disguised, I should say, as humor. So the game was sarcastically named to imply not sorry. Meaning that uh, when you're playing this game, you're not sorry for all of the things that are going to happen in the game itself. And to win the game is to have sweet revenge on all the other players in the experience. Now let me ask, who here has played the game of sorry? Now perhaps this is fun, uh, in an imaginative and controlled, let's say, board game experience. But let me say this, it is absolutely hell in real life. Because one of the most hurtful and wrong things a person can do is say, I'm sorry, and not mean it. Let me say this, it's even worse when a person does say it, they do mean it, and the other party holds on to the wrong or the mistake until the time comes to use it to get sweet revenge. Who's with me? Well, I have your attention this morning. So again, uh, what wrong are you holding on to to take sweet revenge? Folks, let me share this with you. It is time to stop the immaturity in our faith where we're at today. Uh, and, and, you know, and stop tossing. Uh, let me say it this way. Uh, we got to stop that immaturity in our faith and stop tossing back and forth with the waves of anger that continues to pollute our relationships. That blows you and us here from there with anger. All the empty and shallow words of I'm sorry. Where your actions speak more to the game of sorry rather than to the reality of your faith. 
Now let me ask you this, how many of you agree it's time to stop the madness or our hostile ways? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just think about society in this last week with the anger. It's time to stop, let me say this, disputed Christian and, and, and change our revengeful, angry ways in every respect so that we can grow up in the faith together, let me share that, and form the whole body of Christ to reflect the image of God as each does their part to increase the goodness of God. Are you with me? So with that, let's see how to do this through the authority of Scripture, the Bible. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to start with verse 17. We're going to go all the way through verse 32, but stay with me. I think this is going to be very enlightening, and uh, hopefully I can put it in a way that we can all understand and then resolve some of the challenges. Come on now, let's be brutally honest. Let's, let's be a church today. Let's confess our sin just a little bit. Who has maybe a little anger problem? Come on, I do. I, I'm a little sarcastic, right? So, sorry, I just did it, okay? <laughs> all right, let's look at Ephesians uh, 4. Uh, starting in 17. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the writer here. He's inspired, of course, by God. And he just finishes up a conversation with the local church in Ephesus. A church just like ours. And, and uh, he, he, uh, he came to the church. He introduced uh, some things, gave thanks. And, of course, he prayed. And then he got into an issue that the church was having. And the, the issue was they were having a hard time uh, perceiving God's goodness. They were having a difficult time living out the reality or the truth of God the Father. Uh, they were having a, a difficult, difficult time in the sense of seeing the beauty of life. In fact, most of them were uh, living towards the ugliness or badness of life. And finally, of course, Paul is getting into the, the core. They've lost their harmony, their unity. And Paul knows this, and this is where we get into now that discussion. We get into the resolve, but before he does, he gives us a couple of thoughts here. So let's read it together. So Paul says, and I share this morning through the Word of God, so I tell you this, and insist, don't you hate preachers that do that, on it in the Lord. Does it say mommy or daddy there? Does it say your family? No, it doesn't. What does it say? In the... That you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, I need to pause here because we've got to try to figure out what this means. This simply means that Gentiles outside the Jewish uh, community, uh, those folks that are now Christians... Uh, they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in their heart, but they're not processing it. They're not understanding it. So in other words, uh, as I shared with the young people, uh, these are Christians that are heathens in their minds, but have Jesus in their heart, which is an oxymoron. But that is the reality because we have people who have accepted Jesus, and that's the point because he's speaking to the church. So Gentiles do. In the fruitility, that means uh, uselessness. Uh, there is no fruit and not being effective. In the fruitality of their heart. Is that what it says? It says thinking. And I emphasize this because so many people say, I have Jesus in my heart, but they don't give it a second thought. And what that means in getting that knowledge and understanding in place and living it out so that they then become wise themselves. We have to see that because many, and I don't know where you're at, many says, I have Jesus in my heart, but your thought patterns... I need to pause here. This is not even in my notes. None of this is in my notes. Who needs notes? We have to understand how important our thinking is. Because our thinking, please hear this, uh, is the software, to use that analogy, that drives all of our thinking or our performance. Excuse me. Let me say that again. Thinking is the software that drives all of our performance, your performance, your relationships, the culture you're trying to, to cultivate in your mind. 
And of course, the results that we want. And our results are goodness, yes? So important to understand what Paul is sharing here. So in the brutality of, uh, of, the, of their thinking, they are now, the folks that are in their heart but not in their mind, they are darkened in their understanding. Okay? And separate it from the life of God, the goodness of God, the very goodness that we see in Genesis 1, 31. Because of their, what's the next word? Ignorance. Ignorance means, uh, you know, they're just walking around hoping their experience and the data from their senses come in and they'll figure it out. That's pretty ignorant if you're interpreting life that way. Because of their ignorance, that is in them. That's their heart now, their habits. Due to the hardening of their hearts. For you that are not paying attention, I'm speaking to you. Because you've heard, don't even care about what anybody has to say about God's goodness. I'm going to do what I want because I think I'm all that and a bag of Doritos with a Mountain Dew. Not even a diet one on the side. In their hearts. Next. Now, listen to this. Having lost all sensitivity of that goodness, the things of God, they have given themselves over to, what's the next word? I have you say that because it's hard for me to say. Sensuality. So as to indulge. To dive into their own ways. In every kind of impurity. That word impurity in, in, in their vices and their, their, their bad habits, be it their thought, bad habits, emotions, or whatever. And they are full of, what's the next word? Selfishness. Yes? Next. That. I don't know about you, but that's one of my favorite. Uh, I think it's a preposition, right, Rick? <laughs> preposition. Because it implies vision. That over there. That's what I want. Well, my wife's not in here. That's what I want. <laughs> that, now, Paul says to the, to the uh, ones who are paying attention, however... Another one of my favorite words, transition, is not the way of life you learned here at Elevating Life Church. Can I put it that way? When you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the reality of the truth that is in Jesus. Jesus' perspective is, I'm always about my Father's business. Goodness, yes. Is Jesus the good shepherd? He leads us to the good way. Uh, the reality of Jesus. Did He teach commands or give us some wonderfully weird commands that we need to get into our minds so we get into our heart so that we can build a character of self that's going to really be the picture of the image of God? I think so. That produces, uh, let's say, the spirit of understanding, delight, fear, everything we see in Isaiah chapter 11 so that then we can produce the fruits of the Spirit. You were taught with regards... You were taught. Now, we need to pause there, read this. You were taught, because now he's going to remind them, we've already taught you something, and this is the first thing they taught them, that went with regards to your former way of life, bad habits, bad perspective, bad fruit. To put off your old self, that's your old character. you got to wipe away that character so that you can get the perspective of God the Father in there and build the character of Christ in you. Are you with me? So to put off the old self, which is being now corrupted by its deceitful desires. Because we know this, we still uh, we walk away from Sunday, we detach ourselves, we go right back into our old habits, which now throughout the six other days that we live, we're being corrupted by its deceitful feelings or desires or moods or whatever that might be. Are you with me? It goes on to say, to be... To be Made now, here's the thought. You were taught this. He was sharing with his congregation. I share it with you today. To be made new in the attitude of your hearts. No. Conscious mind. You've got to put effort. You've got to think about this. You've got to think about God's goodness. You've got to get, that, uh, get the viruses out of there since we're using the metaphor of the computer. 
and start thinking like Jesus so you get the patterns of thought in your mind. You capture every thought, every thought, so that then you can uh, put on uh, the new self, if you will, is what's coming up. To put on the new self, created to be like Carrie. Drake, no, God. And don't forget, Jesus is the good shepherd. And in our day and age, in contemporary theology, your responsibility is to find somebody that's uh, under shepherd of the good shepherd, Jesus, and get on the main track with that so that you can develop and truly understand that we are getting to the goodness and the picture of what that is. To be like God in true righteousness. That's not being right, that's living right. And holiness. And that means sanctification and salvation, meaning that your, 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 uh, your character is being cultivated through the commands of Christ that sit on the perspective of God the Father and the purity of what that is, the total truth of what that is. Because if that's not in place and your perspective is bad, nothing's good, I have no choice, you're going to experience hell here on earth. Who's with me? It's reality, folks, no matter what your preference is. Be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, now when you see the word therefore, what does it mean? Figure out what it's there for. Each of you must put off falsehoods. Those wrong worldviews, wrong opinions, beliefs, and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Truthfully in the perspective of God the Father, not the perspective of this world, and, and criticize and point out everything that's bad and wrong with them. Okay? Very clear. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and uh, speak truthfully to your neighbor. Now, that's your neighbor outside of the church. That's, your, uh, that's human beings, folks. The goodness of God, the teachings of uh, the Good Shepherd to get those good fruits in place so that then you're a witness and you draw them in. For we are all members of one body. Now we're doing this together. So in your anger, now in your anger just simply means you better have some expectations and understand what the rewards are and what the consequences are. And when you uh, put those expectations and they're not done, you're going to su suffer the consequences, and that's a form of anger. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Read that again, folks, because some of you in this room, I promise you with this many people, there's still somebody who's angry with somebody else in this room. And if, if this happens, you're going to bed with this, uh, this uh, um, inkling of uh, what I call irkness. You're irking me. Oh, God. Angry. For whatever reason. Now listen to the consequences. Here's God's anger now if you're... Wondering what that is? Uh, it's just his expectations not being followed. Uh, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a what? Foothold. This is where we're talking about those Gentiles, those people who have accepted Jesus in their heart, but uh, in their mind, uh, they're giving the devil the foothold because they're not. Their mind is not being. Their thoughts aren't being captured, and those patterns aren't being uh, created. So those bad, evil, malice. Uh, uh, thoughts are being formed, and the devil has a foothold on you, period. There is no question mark there. For some of our Christians who've been a Christians understanding why this is so important, I hope so. Next. Anyone who has been stealing or hurting, you can say there, must steal or hurt no longer, but must work. Not just walking around like a dog hoping everything will fall on you. You must work. You must put effort towards it. Doing something useful with your own actions or your own hands there. That they may have something to share with those who need it. They need your grace. Next. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. No gossip. If it's not your problem, you ain't talking about it. 
it, it, no criticism, no slander, no anger. But only what is helpful for tearing down others. Are you with me? We've got to make sure we know what we're saying. Up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. And guess who's listening? The little ones. Your family. Those that you work with. Those who live with us in society, in our community. And do not grieve. Push down the Holy Spirit here, the goodness of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed. There's justification and salvation there for the day of redemption. And what are we redeeming? The goodness of God and the perversion of this goodness that we call the fall. And you're sealed to the day of redemption. And then he goes on to say, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander along with every form of malice, and that word malice again is hate, evil, cruelty. Now that's Ephesians 4, 17 through 31. We're going to end up at 32, but let me share one story with you first, and I'm done. Years 2017, I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church of Elevating Life Church. And at that point, I've, I had many... Uh, end of life experiences, about 21, 22 at that point. And, but at this time, there was somebody at the end of the life that, who had attended this church from uh, almost just in the nursery, now in her 90s. Uh, she's over at the nursing home in Brush, and I get a call, and they said there's a, a lady here asking for a pastor, and she said she attended First Baptist Church of Fort Morgan. I said, no, yeah, no problem. That's my responsibility, end of life. So I get there, I walk into the facility, and what uh, happened is the staff came to me and said, listen, she is bitter, she's rageful, she's angry, and she's looking to get back and revenge at her pastor. Never even met the lady. I said, no problem. I can take the darts of the devil. That's where I'm at in my walk. Get the armor of God on, right? So I walk in, and sure enough, uh, now she's, she's in the condition. She has dementia, and she's out of her mind. She no longer is dementia. She's gone. She's now living in her heart. Are you with me? She's in her heart, and I walk in, and they, they, she didn't know who I was, and they said, this is Pastor John, not Drake. <laughs> she, she called me. I didn't know little old Christian ladies knew this language. <laughs> okay? She, she beat me up and she came lunging after me. She was angry and she took some swings and the staff was freaking out. I'm like, God, ah, don't worry about it. It's not me. She's not thinking. Something happened back in 1950. <laughs> Something that uh, I had nothing to do, but because of the general understanding of those habits now, she just saw me as that person and her habits her heart, her bitterness, uh, her, uh, her rage and her anger. And she used it for brawling and slander, and she just hated it. Well, my point is here is here's a Christian, I hate to say this, was a heathen, heathen in her mind, but had Jesus in her heart. Well, she's saved. However, is that how we're supposed to live? So get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. So Pastor John doesn't have to visit you. And that's your, his experience and my experience. Or whoever's going to be that, for that person two decades, three decades, whatever that might be. And then, of course, the solution is here, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave you. That is the solution, folks. We have to begin to practice. Now, with this passage uh, read, again, what wrong are you holding on to to take sweet revenge? Even if it's in your heart, you need to, 
got to check out your heart. So from this point forward, it should be nothing. Now, folks, it's time to stop the game of sorry in your life, in all of your relationships, and grow up in the faith. Now, let me ask you, raise your hand if you want to follow God's example. And once and for all, uh, let's say walk in the way of love just as Christ loved you. Raise your hand. And God, uh, hey, that's nice. You guys listen. Gave himself up, you know, God gave himself up, or Jesus did, for that goodness. So allow those, uh, allow the witness of your raised hand there to be the sign uh, that uh, points to uh, and signifies, that's what I'm trying to say, the commitment and engagement that no, that no longer hate. I'm not sorry. (laughs) It's tough. That is hate. Let's get rid of it. So as we leave today, let's remember that our duty is to live in the reality of our faith. Now let me say this. As their team is coming up, understand that sweet revenge is only accomplished by life being lived well towards God's love and with others who believe likewise. Sweet revenge for the Christian is anchoring yourself in God's goodness and being successful through Christ in everything you do. Again, our core verse and resolve for our anger and revenge. Excuse me. Can you read this one? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Amen. Let me say this. It's your move. Never stop. 